Thank you for visiting experiencingliberty.com. If you ever visit the Kansas City area, stop by, we would love to meet you in person. Our prayer for you is for today's message to be a source of encouragement and hope, and quite possibly change your life. We're glad you're here. Today, as we continue in this series uh, called Sacred Soundbites, and uh, if you've been with us uh, through this or any time of this, you know that what we've been trying to do is take passages from Scripture uh, we're calling them sound bites, and kind of look at them from a standpoint of expanding a little bit or maybe even going a little deeper and to see exactly what they mean or how we can apply them to our lives. And I want to say that uh, as we get into this morning's uh, sound bite, I, I want to say that I would love to get up here every so all, all the time and just say how great everything is and how great I am and how great you are and we're all just one big happy family and everything goes great and we love each other and you know don't worry about anything cuz God's got it all under control but every time you every so often you stumble across passages of scripture that kind of are a stumbling block in the sense of what Paul described as stumbling block blocks and you have to take a step back and you have to look at it very intently and sometimes it's a little uncomfortable to really look at what scripture is saying. And it just so happens that today is one of those passages, one of those sound bites. I don't, I, I try not to be the kind of person who just is always, you know, you're sinning, you're doing something wrong, get your life right, what's wrong with you. I try not to portray that kind of approach. And I will try not to portray that kind of approach today, but rather accurately define or accurately look at what this passage of scripture is talking about. With that in mind, though, I do want to say that even in talking about a, a passage of scripture that may be a little uncomfortable, I want you to know that I don't stand up here saying to you something that I am not either dealing with or have dealt with or struggle with myself. This is not a hierarchy where somebody gets up here and just tells you how to live, tell you how to live your life and tell you what God says about you because I've got it all together. That's not the way it works. All of us, every one of us are on this journey together and all of us struggle and all of us have to have these uncomfortable periods in our life that make us take a step back and really try to understand what God is saying to us. And so everything I say today, and I think as far as I can tell, everything I've said to you up to this point, this is not someone coming to you detached from the very essence of the uncomfortableness that is part of my life as well when I come to passages such as this. In other words, what I'm saying is I'm just speaking to myself as well. And you're just kind of listening in onto kind of the struggles that I have with my, with my own life. And hopefully, as I kind of journey through this passage this morning, that this will be something that will help you. The word of God is not about just simply telling us what we, what we do and how we do things and if it's wrong or right. The word of God is solely identifiable by us looking at it through the lens of this is God. This is God of the universe trying to get us to be more closely related and more closely a follower of Jesus Christ. And if we look at it through that lens, rather than what people on the outside seem to say about Christians, that they're no fun, they're just a bunch of rules and regulations and all this stuff, it's not, that's not it. If you're, if you're that simplistic about the word of God, you're missing the point of what scripture is all about. Scripture is all about giving us life and life to the fullest. And I would rather take my chances and my beliefs on someone who has overcome death than to follow a bunch of people whose lifestyles are leading them to death. So in a passage like this, when we get to it, we need to look at it with some objectivity, not all the emotions that come with it. And again, I'm speaking from my heart because I have the emotions associated with this. I have conviction. I have like, oh man, I, I need to look at this and look at that. So please, understand that this is not something that's just coming out of the blue and say, hey, here's something I can hit, hit them with. Uh, this is just my life, my life. 
and the transparency of really what, what, what happened. So with that being said, today's message is really about deceit, deceit, about a deceiver. Now, when we think of deceiver, especially through the lens of scripture, we, we think of it kind of maybe as uh, people out there, maybe false teachers who are teaching things that are not aligned with the Bible, or maybe we even think of it a little bigger and think of it as Satan, the great deceiver. And yet in this particular passage, Peter is talking about a deceiver that is not external to us. The deceiver is me. The deceiver is you. And all of a sudden we have a different perspective on this deceit that's out there. We don't like to be deceived. If you've been in a situation where someone has taken advantage of you because of deceitfulness, they have maybe promised something or they said something and you put your trust in them and then all of a sudden you feel like you got the rug pulled out from underneath you, you know what that feels like and you hate that. Maybe some of you have been victim of that. Maybe some of you have done that. Probably all of us have been on the same side of this. I've been in deceitful situations where I was the perpetrator. I was the one who, deceit, who, who, who led someone into a place that was not truthful. We don't like deceit, whether we receive it or the guilt that comes from when we give it. And yet, when we think of deceitfulness, we think of it externally as though it's out there trying to prey on us. And yet, Peter here comes right to the centerpiece of deceitfulness, and he's like, it, it ain't out there. It's inside of you. Look at this verse from James chapter one, verse 22, because this is the soundbite that we're gonna be uh, focusing on today. And uh, I might need some little help here. There we go. Um, James 1, 22, and this is a familiar verse. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. I mean, right off the bat, this is a pretty simple type of, of verse. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. There's only, what, a few, maybe a dozen words here. But be ye doers, be a doer of the word and not just a hearer because what's gonna happen is you're gonna deceive yourself. You're gonna deceive yourself. Now, again, this is pretty straightforward and, and many of you have heard this verse. Many of you have, you don't even remember the first time you heard it. And it's very, very clear in the words themselves. Follow God's word do God's word, don't just listen to God's word because if you do that, then you're gonna be deceiving yourselves. The key word in this passage of scripture, the soundbite, is obviously the word deceive, deceive. So I wanna look at just three questions about the word deceive, deceive. Because remember, this isn't external. Peter is saying you're deceiving yourself. So here's the first question. The first question is this. What does it mean to deceive? What does it mean to deceive ourselves? It's very interesting. This word deceive here is only used this time in the Bible, this one, at this one time in the Bible. This word deceive is not used anywhere else in the Bible. It's specific to this verse where Peter is saying, you're deceiving yourself. But what, is it, what does it mean to deceive? Well, you, you know I kind of like to do a little word study and kind of really understand the word itself because I think we have an idea of deceive, generally speaking. But what this word is, it's two Greek words that are kind of pushed together. They give you a little bit more nuances about the word itself. The first part of the word says basically to come alongside, to come alongside. And the second part has to do with reasoning. And the com combination of the two comes with it the idea that you are coming alongside some reasoning, but your connection or your conclusion or your reasoning is faulty. It's not normal. It's almost as if you're standing by a group of, of set of incidences that have, have happened and you're over here and you're looking at them, but you're coming to a faulty conclusion. You're a lawyer who has all the evidence or you're a judge who has all the evidence and what you're doing is you're coming to a conclusion that is not real. It is not legit. It is not truthful. And Peter says to those 
of his listeners, which include us, that if you're only listening to the word, but you're not actually doing the word, you are basically in a place that you are looking at your life. You are looking at the instances and the occurrences and things that have happened in your life, the history of your life. And your conclusion is everything's okay. Everything's okay. This is what Peter is saying. You're a judge, you're a lawyer. You have all the evidence. You have the word of God here. You've heard the word of God. You take your life and you see your life against the word of God. And your faulty conclusion is, it's all good. It's, it's, it's all good. And this is what deception means within ourselves, according to what Peter is saying. That we are deceiving ourselves. We are coming to faulty conclusions because we have the word of God. We hear it but we don't actually put it into practice. And therefore we end up as we are deceiving ourselves. Again, we don't don't wanna think of ourselves as deceitful, but that's just the very thing. We don't even see it because we're deceived. Do you understand how, how, how murky this can get? Because we are so confident in our conclusion that we don't even recognize that we are being deceived because we are deceived. How do you come to this conclusion if you're the one who has granted yourself a verdict to say it's all good? You have come to this conclusion. And so we sit here and I think many of us, myself included at times, have gone through our spiritual journeys convinced of the fact that we're good to go but there's nothing to come against me because simply what is happening is it's my conclusion. And when I've deceived myself, I'm living in a world of deceit. Have you ever tried to convince someone of something that they're sure about, but you know it's not a truth? Now think of that being yourself. How do you remove yourself so tightly from your conclusion of everything's okay? between the truth and the deceitfulness. What what is the truth here? Let's go to the second question. The second question is when does, or where does this deception hide? Where does this deception hide? Because I wanna start to break this down a little bit. Now, before we get into the the nitty gritty of of where this deception hides, in this verse, we have be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own self. After this verse, there's some more context that come up. Let me read the next two verses that are, that, are, that are there. Verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. Verse 24 says, for he looks at himself and goes away at once and forgets what he was like. So Peter is starting to break this down a little bit. He's saying what happens is, is we hear it, we listen to it, We kind of take it, but then we walk away from the word and we just forget it like we forget what's in the mirror, like we forget what we've seen and therefore we go along in our lives in this deceitful manner. Now, let me say two things about this deceitfulness before we actually, you know, get into the heart of of really where, where it resides. From what I can tell, in Christianity, after this, is, after this verse you know, came on the scene a couple thousand years ago, Christianity has marched on from this, and we've just marched on, and we've created some things along the way. And one of the things I think we've created when it comes to Christianity is kind of a tiered system of following Christ. We kind of have a tiered system of this. In tier A are all the things that we corporately, we corporately denounce as apart from scripture. And you can look at people and we judge people on this, on these terms. And we define basically some of these, they're, they're kind of low hanging fruit. In other words, if, if you go through life and you're just, you know, very, very mean to people and you're ripping them off out of the, from their money and all this stuff, well, you know, you're, 
you're in that A category. I mean, we all agree that that's a problem. If there's sexual immorality, that's an A group. We all agree that's a problem. If you're, if you're in these situations where you have an addiction that, that takes you into places or, or you're part of domestic violence or something like that or, or anything of, of these low-hanging fruit that we basically define as not following Christ, there's this A tier that most of us agree that, hey, if you're part of this, you know, you got problems, spiritually speaking, and you probably need to get right with God. And I've heard a lot of messages on this kind of stuff. You know, stop doing this, stop doing this, stop doing this. Because it's a, it's a, it's a tier, it's a stuff. I mean, and I think if, if we were to make a list, we probably could come, come up with a, a pretty good list as far as what are kind of the main things that Christians don't do or Christians do do. You know, if you're a Christian, you should read your Bible. If you don't read your Bible, huh, you're, you're not, there's something wrong with you. But then we get to this B category. This kind of B tier that we've kind of defined. It's not really in scripture, but we've defined the B category. The B category is a little murky. It's kind of a gray area where it, there's things in there that reside maybe for you, but maybe not for the person sitting next to you. Because what we kind of do in our minds, and this is, this is, not, this is not from the Bible, this is just from observing you know, church and humanity in my own life is when we come to scripture, we have a tendency to key in on the A tier things that we look at as problematic for Christians, but we are very, very, very easy to let go of the things that we kind of just don't want to absorb from Christ. It's easy. It's easy to do the things that we're not interested in or we look at as, you know, but these other things, this B category where it's not, you know, it's not really that big of a deal if we don't follow scripture in these areas. Yeah, it's important. It's important not to beat your wife. Okay, we agree with that. But over here, there's some things, it, you know, it doesn't really matter. It, it doesn't really matter, right? Right? I mean, for me, with the way I interpret this or the way I look at this or the way my life is going, I tend, to, I tend to look at the scripture just a little bit differently and I don't think it's a big deal. And we have these tiers where if you're caught doing something in the A tier, oh, God help you. Because you wanna talk about a cancel culture? The church can be the worst cancel culture out there. Because if you're caught doing something in the A tier, God help you because the Christian community as a whole, generally speaking, is gonna tear you apart. They're gonna judge you and they're gonna take you to task, take you to task for, for the things that you've done. But on the other hand, if you're over here in this B category, kind of things that we let slide, not really big deal, even though Jesus talked about it a little bit, but not too much. Oh, it's no big deal, no big deal. You can get away with this stuff. Don't worry about this stuff. And I wonder, you know, when James says, be a doer of the word, accept the B category. Don't worry about the B category, just only focus on the A category. Now, another thing I, I've noticed is that as we go through our Christian journey, we're like very pliable. There's a pliability about us and especially when it comes to our hearts. But unfortunately, as time marches on, as we get kind of belief systems locked into place on what we believe and we don't believe, or what we think is important and what we don't think is important, our hearts kind of become set. They kind of become more, less pliable. And it's like, concrete that begins to harden. And then we become very, very rock solid, rock solid in our belief systems about what is important and what is not important. To the point if someone questions anyone who has been in this for years, whose heart is no longer pliable, the question then is basically hit upon a hardened heart 
Because I've been in this, who, who, are you to, who are you to question me on what I've been involved with for 50 years? As though over time, we have in our hearts defined the importance of some scripture and the lack of importance of other scripture. And I've seen this over and over and over again. And I found it in my life over and over and over again. That as I get older, as I get more mature spiritually, the hardening of my heart comes to the point where I have to find for myself, for myself, what is important and what is not important. And when someone questions me or there is something that comes along that questions what I have in the B category, you know, just back away. Who are you to judge me? And yet, in spite of this, here comes Peter, Peter, saying to us, be ye doers of the word and not just hear own, uh, hearers only. Because otherwise, otherwise, you are gonna be over here looking at everything through your hardened heart, through your tiered system of what's important in the Bible, and you are gonna come to the conclusion that is a faulty conclusion and you are going to deceive yourself. Now, at this point, I thought, well, should I talk about specifics? And I went both ways, but I thought, well, heck, I'll talk about them <clears throat> because I deal with them. So I wanna give you some specifics on where I see this play out, where what we put into the B category as opposed to the A category. One has to do, and, and this is a broad one, but prioritizing Christ. Prioritizing Christ. Let me ask you, how important is Christ to you? Not, not based upon, oh, he's important, but how much of your doing of his word lead you to the belief system that he is the priority. He is the priority. You see, it's, it's easy. It's easy. I know the game. I have played the game. The game that allows you to do what is in the A category to project to everybody else that he is the priority. But what about when we pull back from the external and we pull back into the internal. How much of a priority is Christ? How much do the words of Christ, who said it over and over and over, follow me? How much do those resonate with you to the point where in your life, Christ is not a 10 o'clock Sunday morning appointment for an hour, and maybe on Wednesdays. But Christ has infiltrated your life so deeply. He has saturated every part of your life that you don't look at the world through your own lens. You don't look at opportunities through your own lens. You look at it through the lens of Christ because you are so combined. You are so resonating with who he is. But unfortunately, and again, I can't stress this enough. I've been in this situation where it's so easy to live in this tiered idea of, of what, what it means to be a Christian. Meanwhile, all this stuff that doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter if Christ is prioritized in my work. It doesn't really matter if Christ is prioritized with people I'm never gonna meet again. It doesn't really matter the way I treat people. It doesn't really matter. What really matters is I put on a good show and I do all the things that are, we're supposed to do as Christians. And yet Peter, Peter comes and he says, listen, are you a doer of the word? Is this your lifestyle? Is Christ a priority? And again, I just, I just wonder sometimes. I wonder in my own life, is he really the priority? Is he really the one who I have taken to the point where if you cut me, I bleed so much that it, it's, it's, a, it's an outgrowth, it's an outcry of who Christ really is. But we have such a tendency, we have such a tendency. Christianity as a whole has such a tendency to just kind of convince ourselves, to deceive ourselves, 
into thinking that looking at all this and looking at my lifestyle, yeah, there's some things that, aren't, that I should clean up, but they're not really that important. It's a deception. It's a deception. And that's not me saying, that's what the scripture says very clearly. You read the word, you hear the word, you don't do it. It's deceiving ourselves. What about, what about another one? What about pride? What about pride? Pride is one of those sneaky, sneaky, sneaky things that can just enter in. And, and realistically, we know it's a problem, but not the way we do it. Not the way we act. We can spot pride in someone else a mile away. But when it comes to us, you know, we just love the Lord and we just think it, you know, we, we just love the Lord. But pride, you know, if there's one thing that seems to be over and over and over in scripture that is so often just swept under the rug over and over, it is pride. Pride. Practically speaking, how does pride show itself? Well, we have a tendency to think <clears throat> pride will show itself in just simply thinking, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm better than you. Nobody in, this, no, nobody, nobody in this room would say that. I guarantee nobody would go up to anybody and say, hey, I want you to know, I'm a little better than you. Try it after church, see how, see how good it goes. We don't do that kind of stuff. But the way it comes out is in ways that sometimes we almost need to control the way that things happen. We, we kind of look at church even sometimes is that we're the centerpiece of church. And everything that revolves around church should be about me. Do I like this? Do I like this? Do I approve of this? Do I approve of that? Do I like this person? Do I not like this person? And we are the centerpiece of this church. This is deceitful of ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves into thinking that somehow this church or any church is about me and about my likes and about my tastes and about what I get out of it. And it's about, all about me, 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 me. But yet, if you ever talk where there has been a sense where this is a B type tier, I can have my own opinion, I can have my own convictions. And yet it has become so hardened and we don't even see it. We don't even see it that we are living in a world where we think that the church, because of pride, is about feeding me. Scripture over and over talks about the church being the bride of Christ. Why we come together is not about so we can go home feeling better. It's about so we as a community can see the face of Christ as his bride so we can worship God together. And yet, you know, it is so sad to me. And you know, I'm, not, I'm, probably, I'm guilty of it as well. When we look at the church through our own lenses and just because we're not, we're, we're, we're dealing with the low hanging fruit, we got that under control, but this sense of pride comes through it comes through in the sense that we just think the church is just, it's just for me. It's just what I want. It's just how, how I feel. Do, do we understand scripture? When throughout scripture, Jesus talks about him being the one who set up the church. And yet we, we go through this and it's just a deception of ourselves. Pride is seen in our abilities to, to get what we want, to always think that it's gotta be our way, that we have to be the one who has to make all the decisions and it's this, this controlling thing. You're like, well, it's not that important because I'm an A-type personality. As though being an A-type personality excuses you from the, the control issues. Sorry, God, I, you just made me like this. Well, God made us a lot of ways. And we deal with this stuff. Let me throw out another one. Kind of B category stuff, kindness, kindness. Kindness in our words. We can cut deeply with our words. 
And we do cut deeply with our words. And I can tell you instances where I knew what I was doing when I cut deeply, but I deceived myself in some way to say either it doesn't matter, it's not that big of a deal, look what they did, look at, look at how they treated me. And we sit over here and we're just deceiving ourselves. And there's more, you know, there's more we can get into like gossip, giving, you know, all these things, all the B category things that we don't think are important to us. They're, 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 they're important for other people, right? But for me, I have, I have a get out of jail free card for this one. And I, 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 I look at this verse and Peter clearly saying, if you're not doing what scripture says, you're deceiving yourself. So then this leads us to the last question. And the last question is, how then do we deal with, with, this, with this question of deception? What do we do with it? Well, I think there's a few things that even Peter talks about. And let me, let me read some verses here. This goes from um, the next few verses. Verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this person's religion is worthless. I mean, that's pretty cut and dry right there. And through this, this imagery of what Peter is saying, he's talking about how that the way you deal with the deceitfulness is to put that mirror up, keep that mirror in front of you. So let me, let me talk a little bit about, about crashing through the, the deceitful heart. Because even Peter addressed it where he says it's, it talks about deceiving his own heart. I think the first thing you, know, you need to look at, or I need to look at, we need to look at, and ask ourselves, is our heart pliable? Are we able are we able to admit that perhaps we're not all that we crack ourselves up to be? Now, let me, let me say this, and I wanna say this as gently and as, but as objectively as I can. If you've got, to, if you've got with me up to this point, and you think that there's no issue at all. I wanna say this as humbly as I can. I think you need to look at the pliability of your heart. I have, and I, I'm not judging you. I'm not saying, I'm not, it's, it's nothing like that, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you from my own experience that when my heart got hard, it cemented around what I believed and what I valued and what I didn't value. I was, I was ready for deceitfulness of myself. The pliability of a heart simply says that all of us, no matter what age, no matter how long we've been a Christian, no matter our spiritual journey, no matter our past, no matter any of this, all of us, every one of us, have not arrived. We're all on the same journey. All of us, every one of us understands the core of the gospel, which is that you and I are in desperate need of a savior. Why, why do we think this goes away because we've been in church for two decades? Why do we think that the humbleness of our heart just simply needs to be traded out for an authority figure and to tell everybody how to be more spiritual? Yeah, we, we come alongside of each other. We lift each other up. But we also come at it with a humbleness of a pliable heart that is enabled, enabled to look beyond our pride, to look beyond our, our necessity to always be right to look beyond that and see a heart that may have elements of deceit. And it's, it's not that it's, it's like 
damning you. It's the fact that this is Christ and God wanting to lift you up so that you can be closer and closer to him. And yet we harden this so much that when, 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 we, re- when we receive this, it's almost as if it bounces off much like the reflection in a mirror and we walk away from it and it hardens even harder. Because if we don't have the pliable heart, then when we come to scripture, when we come to teaching, whoever it is, scripture from God's word, we are going to be like James talked about, just forgetting what it says and we're gonna walk off and do our own thing anyway. It all starts with the pliability of the heart. And from there, from there we come to scripture. And the question is, how are you approaching scripture? Are you approaching scripture? Are you looking at it through the lens of the ability for scripture to refine you, to convict you, to make you a better follower of Christ? Not to restrict your life, but to give you life. From there then, I think one of the most important parts of this is to be able to have an objective look at our own selves, at our own lives, at the way we are progressing through life. Are we progressing in a way that is open? Or are we looking at life and we look at our Christian life as, you know, we're good. We decided what it was back in 82 and we're good. And, and I just look at these, these disciples and I look at Paul and I look at scripture and I look at the people in, in, even that I've known who throughout their lives, throughout their lives have had this welcoming understanding of scripture, not just to fill up knowledge because we know what knowledge does. Knowledge just, just puffs you up, but it's the actualization of taking that and making it a reality. Because here comes the biggie, here comes the biggie. The accountability from the body. I don't like that one. The accountability from the body. The body of Christ, we don't come together just to shake hands and, you know, show off whatever. One of the purposes of the body of Christ, of us, is to speak truth into one another in a humble way. We're not to judge one another and, you know, what, what, what are you doing? It's, it's not that. That just tears down. The body of Christ is to be basically a place of accountability. But I'm gonna tell you right now, if our heart is not ready to receive, the accountability will be gone and in its place will become judgment and in its place will become divisions. And this is what happens when we harden hearts, when we're not open. Now, does that mean that if everybody says everything to one another, we say, oh my gosh, I'm that bad of a person? No, it doesn't mean like that. Let me give you a really, really deep theological story that'll help you out there. If someone says you smell like a horse, ignore them. If two people say that you smell like a horse, you might wanna buy some deodorant. If three people say you smell like a horse, you better buy a saddle, okay? That's depth there. And all that's saying is that You just don't take everything you hear. But if there is a continuity, a continuity of accountability that says that, hey, you need to look at this, or hey, I see this in your life in the confines of a safe environment, how much would how much would that aid us? I'm not like that though. I, I I don't like that. I try to keep to myself. I try to live in a bubble half the time. I try to keep myself from really, really showing the true colors of who I am. And then if somebody says something to me, I bristle up and I'm like, "Eh, what's wrong with you, you know? But just, just imagine for a moment, just imagine for a moment. Imagine if we came to this place and every one of us, every one of us was interested in helping every one of us become closer to the Christ out of our own humble hearts. Not out of some selfish ambition, not out of a judgment, not out of this is what you should be doing. I don't think that's right, blah, blah, blah. 
but out of a heart of caring, a heart of love, a heart where we are following Christ. Imagine what it would be like if we came together and on one hand we're willing, but on the other hand, we could accept it as well. Instead of falling into our B category, hey, you're never gonna believe what this person is into. You see, I, the, the, the main thing I wanna get across today, all this, all this stuff, the main, the main thing, you, me, my dad, elders, leadership team, sp- speakers, ushers, people who come on Easter, it doesn't matter. All of us, all of us are in desperate need of a savior. And we are in desperate need of him rising and leading us closer and closer to him. And my, I guess my prayer for all of us, myself included, is that we just don't turn off the need and just think that we're where we need to be. Because at that point, at that point, when we hear it, when we come into contact with it, when we hear scripture, when we read scripture, when we do all these things and we're like, uh, it's, yeah, that's, uh, well, okay, whatever. And then we go on and do it. We are, we, are, we are fitting in right into what James said. All we're doing is we're coming to it, we're seeing it and we're walking away. And James is like, no, 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 please don't do that because you're gonna deceive yourself And his last words there, your religion is worthless, worthless. Again, I hope, I hope this is encouraging to you. I feel like sometimes you come to these things and it's a slap, you know, it's a slap across my face and, you know, my my heart, my heart is to encourage you, no matter where you are, to just be open to Christ continually. To realize that we, we, we're not it. We are not it. Only he is it. Let me stay, would you stand with me and let's close in prayer this morning. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the scripture that you give and, uh, you know, as we've, as we've talked about with this, with this verse, I mean, sometimes it's just, you know, I don't really, sometimes I don't even like getting up and talking about this stuff, but yet I feel like, you know, you, it, it is what it is. And uh, as always, I hope that uh, my heart and my words have gone through um, your spirit And they resonate with the spirit of the men and women who are here this morning. Because I think all of our all of our desire is to just is to just help one another become more closely a follower of Christ. Bless us as we leave here, and and I think it goes without saying, but I ask that we just don't forget James 122. That we just don't sweep it under the rug and go back to our lives where we just are closed off to things that maybe we've, we've, we've deceived ourselves in, but we're open. And even my own life, I, I pray that I'm open to it as well. Bless us this week and uh, look forward to next Sunday in your son's name. Amen.